India's deficiency historically has been implementation. We have 1.4 billion people more than any other country in the world. If we can train a large number of those people well, uh, we have access to so much in terms of value creation. And the mainstream in this country is fairly convinced that things are going well. And uh, what we want to say is, yes, uh, they are going well. Some things are going well. Some things are going well. But if we want to prepare for the future, we need to think about a lot of things that we need to do. You must be joking about getting to be a developed, rich country by 2047 with 35% malnutrition today. So, first things first. I read the book, and uh, when I started reading it, I thought um, Raghu had switched parties and he had joined BJP because you say all kinds of good things. Hey, I, I'm not in any party, He's so not I, there's in nothing party, to switch. But, you know, okay. So, for example, I'm a neutral academic. He's a neutral <laughs> academic. Okay. So, I want to list a few things. In the book, you talk about there are some things that the government has done right. right. And you mention goods and services tax. Would you like to say a word or two about it? I, I think what Rohit and I are trying to do with this book is to have a dialogue. A dialogue in which we uh, sort of uh, try as, as best as we can as uh, to talk to, to, you know, the mainstream. Yeah. And the mainstream in this country is fairly convinced that things are going well. And uh, what we want to say is, yes, uh, they are going well. Some things are going well. Some things are going well. But if we want to prepare for the future, we need to think about a lot of things that we need to do. More. More. And uh, also figure out where we are actually going off track, okay. uh, including the things that are not going well. So in order to have that dialogue, we thought it's important to first enumerate the things that are going well. Okay. And, you know, we, we think, for example, the, some of the reforms, the goods and services tax, the bankruptcy code, yeah. those are good things. The uh, infrastructure rollout, which yeah. is happening. And you spent quite a bit of time talking about, I, I'll, I'll read uh, something uh, from your book, which says, there is some sign that with the building of infrastructure, better roads and ports, and more efficient railway freight haulage, transportation logistics costs are coming down in India and getting nearer to global competitive levels. So that's pretty high praise. What we really believe is India's deficiency historically has been implementation. We give the anecdote in this book uh, of a uh, Indian minister going to Korea and asking the Korean minister, you know, you guys have done so well. We were at the same per capita GDP in the 1960s, and now you're an OECD country. How did you manage it? You're so fantastic. And the Korean minister sort of points to a set of volumes on the shelf. So the Indian minister goes much closer, puts on his specs, and looks at it, and says, why? These are our five-year plans. <laughs> and the Korean minister says, yes, but we implemented them. Yeah. <laughs> it's obviously, this was recounted to me by the Korean uh, uh, executive director at the IMF. But uh, I think the point was simply that we have a lot of plans. We implement fewer of them. I think as far as infrastructure goes, the government has implemented its plans, yeah. most of them. And I think I'm again quoting you. You say, government strength has been implementation. Uh, which I think is a high place too. So, a couple of other things you wrote about direct benefit transfers. And uh, some of you may know that uh, Raghu had a role to play in that because when you were the governor, you and Nandan Nilekani conceived of UPI, which we all know how well it is doing. So, well, Nandan conceived it, I took credit. No. <laughs> now, uh, look. Uh, I think success has many fathers, but, but clearly Nandan's design of the India stack and then the layering of UPI on it. We had some small role at the RBI to play in UPI, but it was largely conceived okay. and designed he, by He's NPCI. being um, modest because nothing happens in India unless RBI says, okay. Yeah, well, 
we wished for something which could do what UPI does. And a year later, UPI came, uh, NTCI came and said, we've done it. Now all we need to do is roll it out. And that's, 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 that's how it worked. Okay. But there's also a list of things that were not implemented. Like you mentioned smart cities. Smart cities are dead, right? Nothing happened in smart cities. Demonetization was... Was implemented. <laughs> but was a disaster. It was a... Uh, so implementation, I, being good at implementation has both positive and negative sides. I think that's part of what we're saying, that sometimes you're looking for strong action, but it has to be thoughtful action also. Yeah. And if it's not well thought out, but it's strong, it can be problematic. And uh, you allowed it to happen? Nope. I was gone. You were gone, okay. I was gone. We opposed demonetization, uh, but... Uh, okay, they didn't ask you. They asked you and you said no. They asked me, I said no, but we didn't have a legal right as the, as the central bank okay. to say no. Okay. So uh, that is where it was. Okay, so now let's get to the substantive thing. You spend a lot of time in your book about you're saying these production-linked incentives are a bad thing. So let's start with why we are saying we need to rethink where we're going, okay? And what we're saying is, if you think about the global supply chain, okay, uh, and the best way to illustrate it is with Apple. Think about an Apple iPhone. The design and the content for the iPhone iPhone is done by Apple, the intellectual property. And actually, even the design is patented. The, the structure of the iPad or the structure of the iPhone is patented. All that stuff is done by Apple in Cupertino or in its various offices. So the Apple, if you look closely, it says designed in California. Why does it say that? Because it's not made in California. It's made by Foxconn. In fact, Apple stopped making anything in 2004. So it does none of the manufacturing. But it also does what is at the other end of the supply chain closer to the consumer. So this is the conceptualization. Then there's the manufacturing. Then there's getting it to the consumer. On that end, it does the financing, the marketing, uh, you know, the selling. Uh, think of those spectacular um, uh, Apple, Apple stores, and it does the iTunes, it does the apps. Apps, huge generation because it gets a commission for every app that's sold. Put it all together, if you look at the global supply chain for the iPhone, Apple owns both ends. And why am I putting my hands up? Because that's where all the value added is. So think of the smile curve, that's what they call it, value added on the y-axis, the chain uh, sequence on the x-axis. The early parts, are what Apple owns, and the later parts are what, it ap what Apple owns. The valley of the smile is what Foxconn owns. That's the most competitive part of the manufacturing supply chain. Why? It used to be that you know, it was profitable. When you were competing with industrial countries, with their workers, you could make some profits there. Today, all the emerging markets are competing in that area. Vietnam is competing with China, is competing with, uh, uh, with Malaysia, and et cetera, et cetera. So as a result, any of the rents there have, it, have been competed down. So one, one way to see this is Apple's market value on a good day is $3 trillion. Foxconn's market value on a good day is $50 billion. There's a 64 difference between the two companies. So what we're saying is the following. Think about where you want to be uh, going forward. Yes, if manufacturing comes, you have a competitive advantage, great. And that's why I like the infrastructure push. It's trying to make us more competitive broadly, but also in manufacturing. But if you have to subsidize the hell out of something, do you want to go compete for the lowest part of the supply chain or compete for the higher end of the supply chain? And what we're saying is, the beauty about what India is doing, when you look about uh, around you, exactly where you are, Cyberabad, you find that India is competing at the higher end of the supply chain also. You know, 20% of chip design is done in India, right? That's part of the higher part of the supply chain. 
all these global competitive uh, capability centers, which we see, you know, stacked around uh, Hyderabad, they are employing people to do the value added stuff, to do the design, to do the creative stuff, to do the software. So, Bhagwan, our question really is, why are we subsidizing manufacturing so heavily? Because the belief that we start low and move high doesn't apply. We're already there. Why do you need to capture this? So, in a sense, the logic behind the government subsidizing PLI with huge amounts. And you're saying those subsidies are enormous. You say uh, they're spending about $2 billion for 500 jobs. This is... Uh, 5,000. But 5, 000, this, is, 5, 000 this, 000 is, this is the micron example, which is uh, as egregious as it gets, right? We want to make chips, right? Like the rest of the world. The rest of the world wants to make chips. Why do we want to make chips? Feels good, right? Actually, there's a whole security. That's not why we want to make chips. No. So I will uh, yeah. let me interrupt you. Okay. You also say there is no Indian chip firm like Qualcomm on Nvidia. Okay. It would be nice. It would be spectacular. You say to have a globally competitive national company. So my question is, isn't this calculation a bit short-sighted? And say, okay, two billion for five thousand. How will we get one like this if we don't start? But why do you want one? Because I'll quote Elon Musk. Elon Musk says, people who are designing chips and people who are manufacturing need to be next to each other. Not necessarily. Okay, tell me why. Absolute, uh, absolutely wrong. NVIDIA is in the US. Its chips are manufactured by TSMC about as far from it as possible on this globe. Okay. 12,000 miles away. Where is this? You have to be next to each other. You don't need to be next to each other. And NVIDIA is two and a half times the market value of, Qual of TSMC. Yeah. Right? So you're saying only, only have NVIDIA and... Uh, I'm not saying only have NVIDIA. Okay. I'm saying look at the Micron factory. You're spending $2 billion to get them to come here. You're not, you're not, you don't own it. It's a subsidy. It's not equity. It's a subsidy. They're spending 700 million, billion, 700 million. We're spending 2 billion to create 5,000 jobs for not logic chips. We're not talking H100 NVIDIA chips. But in the short term. We're talking really run-of-the-mill memory chips. Okay? Okay? You agree with that? Yeah, but we have to start something. No, no. But again, you have to tell me why we have to start. I'm challenging this question this point of we need to make stuff. It's manufacturing fetishism. If we can make stuff, we do make stuff. We do make, make two-wheelers. We make pharmaceuticals. Yeah. We make a whole bunch of things where we have some advantage in. Yeah. Okay? I'm saying the world is subsidizing chips to an enormous extent, which is why we have to pay so much to get these guys here. Yeah. If everybody's jumping over the cliff, shouldn't we ask why are they jumping and why should we jump? Okay. What? So, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Mm -hmm. That two billion dollars of subsidy is one third the higher education budget of the central government. One third. Yeah. But it's all the IMs, IITs, um, you know, uh, uh, TIFRs, etc. All that they get. This factory is eating up one third of that. Yeah. It reflects a complete lack of sense of priorities. Okay. I think that argument is a little specious. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because our constraint about IITs and Indian Institute of Sciences yes. is not the money we can pour in. Yeah. It's the faculty. It's the talent. Faculty right? is money. Okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, faculty is money. Okay. Look at what China is doing. It's bringing back its high quality faculty from outside saying we'll take care of your living conditions. That's what ISP is about. We set up ISP precisely with this idea. It would be comparable to the rest of the world because it would attract faculty from the rest of the world. To attract that faculty, you have to pay money. Don't tell me money is not at stake. It is at stake, fundamentally. However... You can tell why we invite him to ISB all the time. Okay, <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Let me say one more thing. 
It's not that we can't afford a spectacular higher education system. Seven and a half lakh students go abroad every year to get an education at the undergrad level. Now, I'm not in any way grudging the fact that they're going to get a good education outside. But if we had more universities of high quality, we could retain many of them. It would be at the first step, import substitution. But at the second step, you would attract people around the world to come here and study, you know, from the Middle East, from Africa, uh, from East Asia. And you would generate an export industry because they would come here and pay you foreign exchange. It would be an export industry. Okay. So uh, the bottom line I'm, I'm saying is, I don't see why chips should be privileged over universities. Okay. In fact, in the longer run, universities are going to get us much more than chips. Okay, so we will get there. So I think if I can rephrase you, you're saying you're not against manufacturing. You're saying we don't need to subsidize manufacturing a great deal. Is that? I, look, I, I, I will nuance it even more. I will accept the fact that for certain critical places where security is, is at stake, etc., you might want to subsidize that particular. But you need to make the case. It has to be the rarest of rare. I don't think we will be independent in high quality chips for a long time, for a long time, okay. right? And, and I think if we can be friendly with the rest of the world that is manufacturing chips and is likely to have a glut, we can actually buy them cheap. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be dependent on China for chips. We can be dependent on the US, Germany, Taiwan, all the countries that are making <laughs> chips. If you want to become independent on chips, even China is finding after pouring hundreds of billions into it, that it's not independent because this new chip they came out with has used ASML machines. And you will see soon that there will be some reaction because you've used these machines and those machines you're not allowed to use beyond a certain point. Yeah, but so, so you do say that we are not against manufacturing. We are not saying, let's go to service instead of manufacturing. So I'll quote something and say, does India need to choose between manufacturing and services? Both are highly intertwined today. But then you go on to say, but we still have to make choices on where we want to devote resources in people or in things. My question is, and I'll put it delicately, why do we, we have to make that choice? Why can't ha I have a wife and a lover? <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> because Bhagwan, you have a budget constraint. <laughs> let's, let's focus on the medium term, right? In order to get the medium term right, we have to focus on India's most important asset. Yeah. It's human capital. Okay. We have 1.4 billion people more than any other country in the world. Okay. If we can train a large number of those people well, uh, we have access to so much in terms of value creation. Okay. So and I, so I would say, let's start with that. Figure out what's going wrong there and fix it. Okay. I don't think anybody will disagree with you. Yeah, they, yeah. You, everybody tells me this. We don't disagree with you, but we won't put the money there. We won't invest in this. We won't fix the problem of malnutrition. 35% of our kids suffer from malnutrition, right? And when I say this, with, I'm telling you, with, with the crowd that should be most concerned about it, our business people, they say, oh, we know about it. Well, if you know about it, why haven't we done anything about it? Well, we do something about it, but we haven't fixed the problem. Many countries have tackled it on a warlike war situation and fixed the problem. I see this because we are fixated with becoming a developed, rich country by 2047. So I use this as an example to say, you must be joking about getting to be a developed, rich country by 2047 with 35% malnutrition today. Why? Because these kids are going to be 35% of your labor force in 2047, right? Yeah. 20 years from now, those babies today will be entering the labor force. How do you expect to be a developed country when 35% of your labor force is mentally stunted, physically incapable, because it's 
you know, malnutrition does all sorts of things to your body and exposes you, uh, you know, to a lot of health conditions at that point. Yeah. So if, I want to say that if we want to get there, let's start doing our homework today. Don't say these are problems we know of. We know education is an issue. We know healthcare is an issue. We need to deal with it. Amartya Sen has been speaking, talking from the rooftops, but I, I think we need to make the case why this is important. Yeah. So uh, let, me, let me say a little bit. So human capital, I agree with you. I'm an you, academic. You, I, I believe in human capital. But, um, but here is the issue. Okay. Um, you know, Ashwini Vashno has been, you know, very critical. And you have always said to Ashwini Vashno, show me the data, right? Show me the numbers, how you came up with this. So I'm going to ask you the same question because I believe I'll rephrase the famous saying, in Modi we trust, but everybody else has to bring data. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. No, but, but more seriously, yeah. human capital, you're yeah. talking about doctors, nurses, lawyers. Yeah. We have 1.4 billion people. Yeah. How many of these jobs are you imagining? Uh, look, mo many more than we have now. Many more. Yeah. But will we be able to find jobs where only okay. doctors, lawyers so, so, we need to... Uh, so, so Bhagwan, Bhagwan let me ask you this. You've been to a doctor recently in any big city here? Have you, I mean, you've obviously seen the large queue outside in a top-notch city. It's not like there's there's uh, inadequate demand for medical services. You see the queue for guys who don't have medical certificates even, you know, the, the barefoot doctor. Show me the numbers. How many? How many of such jobs? You, you said, and I believe yeah. you, the number one thing here is jobs, jobs, yeah. jobs. Yeah, yeah. How many of such so, jobs? So the point, is, the point is, you start educating people, right? Better. Got it. Okay. They don't all have to be doctors. They don't have, all have to be nurses. They don't all have to be. But over time, as you do all this, right, as the number one problem today is that the people, right, who are entrepreneurs and they're looking for workers, they keep complaining. This was a constant complaint. Now you're going to ask me for evidence. They say, where are the people who are trained for our, our work? We just can't find workers. In a country where there are a huge number of unemployed people, the manufacturers are saying, we can't find the workers. Now you ask me, what's the data on unemployment? Well, what is the data? CMI says 10% right now. And this is relative to historical levels of CMI data. This is high. The periodic labor force survey, we have terrible data on unemployment, terrible, which is why um, you know, BJP spokesman can say it's, it's nothing. It's, it's really low. But I think if you, if you, if you actually look around, uh, you see massive evidence of underemployment. You see massive evidence of unemployment in the sense that 12 million people applying for 20,000 uh, railway service jobs. That is suggestive. And these guys are all educated. So let me, let me talk about this human okay, capital. Okay, educated. Human yeah. capital. Okay, the kind of education you want, I'm for it. Right. But Raghu, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight, yeah. right? But in the meanwhile, we still need to... How many to years right? of this government have we had? Okay, let's look forward. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm saying we've had 10 years. And we could have started investing early on in fixing malnutrition. We could have started early on in fixing the... We could have started 20 years ago. Okay, today... <laughs> today... No, no, absolutely. Right. What we say, what we say in the book is every single government has failed us on, 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 on human capability. Okay. Uh, this yeah. is being, please send this. Yeah, he's, okay. saying, he's not saying just the current government. Right, I'm saying we, we have failed. All governments have failed. Have failed this. on this, yeah. right? We, we, where we fall behind China is precisely on the quality of our human capital. Right. Right? So I agree. Right. But I think it will take time. I'm no, realistic. No. It will take time, but we got to start today. we got to start today. Yeah. I agree. we got to start investing. So second... Actually, there are lots of jobs in creating human capital itself that we can start thinking of, right? Such as? So, for example, um, we, um, 
another thing we complement, the national education policy, which came out in 2020. Fine document. Uh, some things we don't agree with, such as every teacher has to have a beard. We dispute that. That seems yeah. rent-seeking by the teacher community. And uh, how long will it be before we implement any okay. of this? Yeah, but national education policy came out in 2020, has not, an, you know, not really been implemented. Yeah. One important suggestion, we should be lots of jobs, right? And others, Abhijit Banerjee makes this. Um, actually, this is not Abhijit, this is Karthik. Karthik makes this suggestion. How about getting another worker in every Anganwadi? What if we got a mother of one of the kids, usually 10th class pass, maybe 12th class pass, to teach the kids basic alphabets, to play with them and teach them basic math? That's not beyond a 10th, 12th class pass. You could employ over a million, because there are over a million Anganwadis. As you said, everything in India gets multiplied very quickly. Right. You could employ a million today and make a huge difference. There are RCTs doing this. A huge difference in the quality of early child care. This is what they're trying to do in developed countries. We need to do more early child care. We could do it. And that would employ a lot of people. So there are two things. How do we get jobs for the people we have? And as you said, not everybody is well-trained, not everybody is well-educated, but there are still lots of jobs that can be done by them. So in this case, the 10th class pass can teach kids. But the more important issue is, how do we train our people for the jobs they aspire to? They aspire to a lot, they're not trained for that. And that's the second aspect, how do you upgrade human capital? Even there, the state of Tamil Nadu that I work with is working on these kids who graduate 50% of them, according to a survey, are unemployable because they simply don't have the skills yeah. for doing what they're supposed to do. We've worked with a bunch of firms to give them that last mile training. How do you up them from where they are to where they can actually work for you, right? Firms like Cogensis, et cetera. Those guys have come in and started training in a big way and have filled that last mile. We could do far more of that across the country. Okay, all right. So now, now I'm going to uh, do a, uh, a slightly different role play, okay? I'm going to pretend like I'm PM Modi, okay? No, uh, well, uh, I mean, I, I have to be respectful to the Prime Minister of the country. So why don't you be somebody much lower? No, so... <laughs> I want to call you back and say, come and help me. And I am convinced that manufacturing is what I want to develop. So give up your idea of service. I'm thinking about it. But tell me how to do manufacturing better. What would you tell? Well, I'm trying to uh, convince him that he's wrong. <laughs> okay. That was not I mean, your I, job. Your job is to tell me what I need to do to fix manufacturing. So, in so that's Bhagwan asking the question. That's Bhagwan asking the question. Okay. If Bhagwan is asking the question, how do I fix manufacturing, right? Or how do I move forward in manufacturing? One of the things you have to understand is as far as commodity manufacturing goes, where it's the most competitive area, we're okay. really outclassed. Where we find India has done reasonably well is in uh, sort of incremental engineered manufacturing. What do I mean by that? Yeah, give an example. Where the product needs tweaking and you need skills in science engineering to tweak it. Take our generic pharmaceuticals. The reason that became a, a spectacular success, including providing those AIDS, uh, you know, cocktail, uh, which, you know, Hamid Yusuf, whom we met for this book, described how he did that. But where they did really well is actually by weakening the patent law. In, in the early 70s, the patent law was weakened, saying the final, the final compound was not protected. The way of manufacturing that compound was protected. So all the Indian generic manufacturers made their way by finding a different way of generating the final compound. And therefore, they actually had a flourishing business, right? Because they didn't pay the royalties to, those, uh, to the pharmaceutical companies. And Hamid built a business on that. Yeah, we shamelessly copied and... Shameless... Uh, well... Which is okay. I think I'm... Copied process. Copy. Uh, they, Good ideas should be copied, right? Good, it, it, that's how humanity progresses. Innovated process, right? 
innovated process, uh, not the final compound. Yeah. Then came TRIPS, which basically said, you can't do this anymore. And that's when uh, pharmaceutical generic manufacturers became really commodity manufacturers. And that's when, you know, all the, uh, a lot of the stuff uh, went, went away to China. Another successful industry is the two-wheeler industry, in, two industry. Again, because there are design changes in each. But the point in all this is we haven't transcended to making a spectacular motorcycle of our own. I mean, who do you see who would buy an Indian motorcycle, um, you know, at the expense of buying a BMW or an Italian motorcycle? But we could. We had hero cycles. You mentioned that. And because there was a big domestic market, that did well. So now, yeah. why shouldn't we do the same thing with cell phones? There's a huge market for cell phones. We can do it. Don't subsidize it. You say the labor cost advantage no longer exists. Right. You write in the book. You also say the manufacturing bus has left. And I feel like the ma manufacturing bus may have left, but it has just seen a red light with the geopolitical yeah. situation. Uh, so maybe we can catch up. So can you show me some numbers and can you tell me, are the Indian wages not still lower than wages in China? After all, China per capita income is now five times that. Of no, no. Uh, it has to be productivity adjusted, right? So okay. wages in China are higher than India, but productivity adjusted. So there was this comparison. Uh, I'll show, send you the document. UPS did a comparison. How much does it cost to assemble a fan? This is lowest end manufacturing across a variety of countries, right? The old uh, Asian model was that of a flying geese, uh, goose, flying, of flying geese. You had Japan in front, Taiwan and, and Korea behind, and then the uh, Malaysia, Thailand behind still, and China at the back, okay? And what that meant was uh, Japan would go into the, uh, you know, would start first with textiles, etc., then leave that and go into higher-end manufacturing, leave that, go into the highest-end manufacturing. It was leading the pack, the others were following behind, right? So this was the, uh, the uh, flying geese model. The problem, however, is China is a really, really big goose. And China occupies a lot of space, even though it's there at, in the frontier industries now, it's also in textiles, because there still are a number of Chinese waiting to be employed from in the Western provinces, still a number in agriculture. And what are the wage numbers? Is there a differential? or is There, there is a wage differential. China is allowing its wages to also grow. But remember, China has a lot more capital per worker, has far better logistics. Put it all together, UBS says it costs the same to assemble that phone in China, Vietnam, India, and, uh, and, and I think it was Malaysia. And given that there are so many jobless uh, in India, what are the real wages in India? I think they're still pretty low. You see, the, the, uh, what we're saying is you cannot look at the number of unemployed in India and say these guys will push the wage down because they're unemployable. And the number, the... Uh, that's why we're saying skill these guys up, then you will be able to essentially have cheaper workers. Okay. But so long as you have only a limited number of workers who can do the job, uh, it doesn't matter that you have so many unemployed. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about the issue of uh, democracy and uh, freedom. And uh, Your Modi or your... Uh, <laughs> I'm a chameleon. Okay. <laughs> we like those uh, values. I like those values. My question is, where is the evidence that democracy and freedom leads to growth? When I look at this huge success that China had, it had little to do with democracy and freedom. It's, it's not so much necessarily leads to growth. Actually, we're, I'm willing to concede that certain kinds of manufacturing uh, in their early stages can actually benefit from a more autocratic government, right? And, you know, put China head to head with India. Uh, today in India, you want to acquire land. 
it's really difficult because you get the democratic reaction, right? Uh, we've been stuck in this Mumbai, Ahmedabad high-speed rail, uh, which was a, a, a grand showpiece project of this government, but it's been stuck because, you know, to some extent, land acquisition has been difficult. On the other hand, China, over, you know, maybe 10 years more than we have, has built out 30,000 kilometers worth of high-speed rail. That's because it's much easier acquiring land in China. You don't have a democratic op opposition. You don't have politicians campaigning on the street against that. It can be done easily. Similarly, during the period of Chinese growth, they did keep wages below productivity growth. And one of the ways they managed to do that was putting a lid on union action. More recently, why have wages gone up? Because they've said, OK, it's time for us to consume more we should allow wages to rise faster. So there is a switch that they control, much harder to control in a democracy. And if you look you know, at countries, Rohit has plotted this out, uh, in uh, development time and their democratization, it is true the US and the UK democratized, but pretty late in development time in the sense that they actually were quite rich before they had universal suffrage in, in today's uh, dollars. India was democratic right from the beginning. And so arguably you could say, you know, maybe India should have been uh, more autocratic in the development process. Every East Asian country has been relatively autocratic earlier on. And then like Korea, like Taiwan, become more democratic. But I would say... Don't, don't wish for it. No, 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 no. Uh, you, you, uh, the problem with, with trolls is they take the first piece and don't listen to the second piece. The second piece is where we are today, it makes no sense to go backwards, to be autocratic. Because if we are on the, on the brink of this ideas, creativity, services revolution, the best sort of government for that is democratic. Now, you, you asked me what's the evidence. There's a whole bunch of historical studies we cite we show the connection between creativity, between ideas, and uh, you know freedom. Uh, and, and I think that's, 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 it's pretty clear how that would come about, but it's actually there in fairly rigorous uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, studies that focus on causation. You say in your book, I think uh, quite an insight, that even though China was authoritarian, at some level, uh, I think the word you used was corruption was a lubricant because at the level of the municipality, they were competing. Yeah. And that greased the wheels. Well, what, what we say is another difference. So one difference between China and India is Chinese workers were much better educated. And Yashin Huang from MIT makes this point as to one bi the big difference, why China's liberalization took off and took the role of manufacturing. But another difference that my colleague Chang Tai She points out is that China's doing business numbers look pretty mediocre. Yeah. The, you know, doing business is a World Bank index which looks at how easy it's to do business. Doesn't look like it's easy doing business in China, yet it has this spectacular yeah. growth. And he argues the reason is every local government official basically is rewarded on growth and therefore tries to champion their local uh, firms. And they do that by tailoring the rules and regulations to their firms. And, you know, Indian businessmen always used to tell me the story, that, right? They go to a Chinese uh, municipality, the mayor meets them at the airport, takes them to a room, says, here are all the documents you've got to sign. Once you're signed, sign them, you're in. It was so easy to start a factory there. How? Because they broke all the rules for the people that they wanted to break the rules for. The point, however, is that decentralization help them grow because it allowed a tailoring of rules. Some of it was corruption. Some of it was, I am incentivized to grow my province. But what kept them really honest? What kept this cronyism? You can call it local cronyism. What kept it from being detrimental is they had to compete with each other. So it became competitive cronyism. And that put some discipline, some efficiency into this process. So, so my sense is that was another, another advantage. But we argue in this book for much more decentralization in India, more for the um, idea of uh, encouraging the creation of human capital. 
you look at the places in India that have focused most on education and healthcare, they typically tend to be the decentralized places. And yes, there's a study on this also in the state of Uttar Pradesh. That's why you need to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, take the state of Delhi, the Ahmadbi Party, how it's focusing on building, uh, you know, these, these crates, which are its healthcare clinic, on cleaning up the schools, making them more, more attractive. I think for the first time, government schools beat the private schools in, in educational outcomes. So I think that uh, one of the reasons for more decentralization in India is you can get more, uh, you know, focus on healthcare and education because the people can see what they're getting and can complain very quickly if they're not getting the right thing. So, thank you, Raghu. I want to end with uh, something you quoted in your book, which is that we have become very good at uh, uh, publicizing uh, things. But you wrote something that I, in fact, I put it on Facebook today, that mehnat itni khamoshi se karo ki safalta shor bacha So on that, please give a big round of applause.